Mr. James, sir. Are you James? Hi. Haytham Kenway. Pleased to meet you. I know who you are. I was hoping you could answer some questions. I figured as much, but not here. Follow me. Oh, well, what do you want to know? Have you seen or heard anything out of the ordinary since we left port? Anything that gives cause for concern? Some of the men have been gathering at night on the upper deck. I've only caught bits of their conversations, so I couldn't say for certain what they're up to. But I suspect it bodes ill. Is it a mutiny they're planning? All I know is they've little love for the captain. Mills has been trying to talk him down, but there's only so much one man can do. Thank you for the information. I only wish to see us reach the colonies alive. So the point is to uh, stock them, stake them out. Evening, sir. You the navigator? How are things? Calm and quiet. Just the way I like it. What brings you topside? Thought I'd wander a bit. Stretch my legs. That's all. Take care where you tread. The deck hides all manner of danger in the dark. What was that? The hell was that? What? Someone's throwing cargo overboard. But why? The hell? Aren't you a talker? No? Okay. He's a shippy fella. Won't only take his He's got a rations again. Claims we're not provisioned for such luxuries. It's not right that you should feast lamb and wine. We're stuck with tinned fish and biscuits. Curious. Hmm. Most curious. The hell? This isn't the end of the day. Something weird happened. Back and forth. My people saw from all that walking. You had it most. You're not having second thoughts, are you? I'm not going to be done. Quite the base thing you gave Graves and Quill. Wasn't by choice. Aye. Blockheads, the both of them. Where are my manners? Louis Mills. Pleased to meet you. Atham Kenway. Not shaking his hand? Come on. So, should I be watching my back? I think the boys learned their lesson. That they're normally not so nasty. Honest, it's just the past few crossings have been a bit rough. Oh? Captain's trying to cut costs, reduce rations, lower wages, more dangerous cargo. It's put the crew on edge. Is there cause for concern, then? Not okay. if I can help it. But the captain needs to think about the way he treats his men. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm done. Day 33. Almost there.
Any news? Each night's the same. I scout one area, and they drop the painted barrels from another. I'm going to need to recruit an extra pair of eyes. Maybe James or Mills. Why are they doing this? Near as I can tell, the barrels serve as markers. They're leaving a trail. My fear is it's only a matter of time before whoever's following it. Ship sighted aft! She's making ready to fire! Beat to quarters, men! Ready the... Incoming! Ace. Everybody down! So we're gonna get the cannon tutorial now. A warning shot! Seems they don't mean to sink us, but board us instead! Man the cannons! Make ready to fight! I want you below decks. Why? Let me help you secure the ship. Do you know how to rig a sail? To load a cannon? To wage war at sea? I didn't think so. Now return to your cabin. Or do I need to have you escorted? Call me if there's borders. Secure the hatch! Hey, Tim. Have you been topside? A ship's appeared and means to board us. It's strange. There's no sign of mutiny aboard. It doesn't make sense. Ah, but it does. What do you mean? Did you think you could escape from London so easily after what you did at the opera? That we wouldn't notice? That we wouldn't follow? Ah. Oh. Uh -huh. So that's what this is about. Surrender, and I will see that you are treated with honor. If you wish to treat me with honor, give me a sword. Are you sure this is how you want to play it? Sorry. I told you to stay below decks. I did as you asked. Only Mills was there waiting for me. He's the one that drew that ship here. There was no mutiny. Only him. What do they want? Me. Me. Then they can have you. Is that so? They'll catch us anyway. There's nothing to be done. I can think of something. You wish us to sail into the storm? It's our only chance. I won't do it. And then I will. All right. All right. Don't show him the hidden blade. Oh my god, I'm getting seasick just watching this. Tell me what I to told do. You this was Arm yourself. I'll fix your sail for you. What do I need to do? Need more speed! Lose! 
Loose the sails! Hate them! You take the foremast! James! To the mainmast with you! Aye, aye. Get off the rigging! Secure that tackle! Oh my god. This is insane. Oh crap! We lost the main mass! Templar assholes! Oh, whoa! They went down. Okay, we made it. Just need to fix the sail. Oh, day, se day 72? That's a long trip. that wax so Hayton Kenway Connor Kenway is the main character and Edward Kenway is from Black Flag I see no land, only this interminable fog. The gulls tell us all we need to know. Climb into the crow's nest and you'll see. Ooh, climbing. Climbing the crow's nest. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, climb the crow's nest. Like this. Let's synchronize the ship. Well, land ahoy! Finally, opening credits! Now we're 15 minutes in. You progress. Boston, seventeen fifty four. That's not the same ship. Master Kenway. Master Kenway. Yes, may I help you? Charles Lee, sir. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. I've been asked to introduce you to the city, help you settle it. Oh, no need, sir. I've arranged for your bags to be delivered to the inn. Are you by any chance John and Isabella's son? Charles Lee, born 1731. He was a British soldier who went on to be a major figure in the Revolutionary War. Lee's father was a colonel in the British Army and started his son off 
in the military career early. He was sent to a military academy in Switzerland during his formative years, and then in 1746, Lee became an ensign in his father's regiment. Lee was sent to the colonies in 1755 to fight in the French and Indian War. He served under Edward Braddock and then later at Fort Ticon Ticonderoga, where he was injured in the fighting. Lee recovered and later fought at Fort Ni Niagara. I always thought there were a lot of forts fights fought. He finished his time in the colonies with the British conquest of Montreal. Lee returned to England in 1760, possibly because he was seeking career advancement. He was named a major in 1761 and was sent to fight the Spanish in Portugal. Though his service record there was good, Lee didn't receive praise on his return home. In fact, he was retired from the army at half pay. After that, Lee became a vocal critic of military higher-ups and the British Prime Minister and found that his military career had inexplicably completely stalled. Reginald Birch, born 1705. Reginald Birch was a London merchant, the son of another London merchant, who conveniently enough also had the last name Birch. It seemed it was one of those how to put your finger on things that ran in the family. Birch started in business for himself at early age. By the time he was in his mid-twenties, he already owned several merchant ships, mainly dealing with the sea trade to the American colonies. That's pretty good going, seeing as by the time most people are in their mid-twenties, they don't even own a shirt. I have him as part owner of the Providence, among others. Later in life, Birch also owned several businesses in and around London. He was a member of White's, which was a posh gentleman's club in London, and generally a well-known and respected man about town. From what I can tell, Birch met Hayston Kenway while walking for his father, Edward. They were introduced at White's while Hayston was still quite young. Birch would eventually take over Hayston's education, tutoring him while on tour of Europe in the 1730s. From what we've seen in the Animus, it seems their friendship continued into adulthood, with them walking together as members of the Assassins. Hmm. One and the same. Your commission is with Edward Braddock, is it not? Aye. But he's yet to reach America, and I figured I might... Well, at least until he arrives. I thought... Yes? Out with it? Forgive me, sir. I had... I had hoped that I might study under you. Hello, sir. If I am to serve the Order, I can imagine no better mentor than yourself. Kind of you to say, but I think you oh, overestimate yeah. me. Impossible, sir. This way. Thief! Come on! Should I stop him? Well, I didn't get a mission target. Boston's quite a lively city. There's all manner of things to see and do. Once you've settled in, I suggest you take some time to walk the streets. Who knows what opportunities you might discover? Hold a moment. I need to fetch a few things before we get to work. I'll arrange for horses while you do that. British what? World maps. Um, map? There's not a lot of a lot here. British regulars. British regulars were the foot soldiers of the British Army. You'll also hear them referred to derisively as redcoats, because of the redcoats they were as part of the uniforms. I bet you didn't see that one coming. Or lobsterbacks because of their huge deadly pincers. Or still because of the red coat thing. I can't remember which. Regulars in the colonies were notoriously underpaid, and many looked for work outside of their army duties to make ends meet. Of course, their room and board was paid by the government, meaning they could charge lower than average rates for their work. Since unemployment was high in Boston before the revolution, you can imagine this made the Redcoats rather unpopular among people they were taking work from. That and their huge daily pencils. Until such time as repairs have concluded. Still a pretty game. Markets. There are a number of public markets in the colonies, meaning you can get supplies easily. Of course, paying for goods is another matter, as currency was incredibly complex. People paid in English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese coin, wampum, New Jersey, and New York bills, magic beans, laundromat coins, the list goes on. We simplified everything down for you in the animus. You're welcome. 
While some markets sold a variety of goods, like Fenuil Hall in Boston, others were more specialized. New York's Quinty's Slip was mainly a fish market, though like most markets it sold a little of everything. While if you were in the market for African slaves, Peck's Slip was the place to go. Yes, slavery was legal at the time, though it was less common in Boston than New York, which had the largest slave population in the north. Don't be surprised to see European servants for sale, either. Some were sold for a fixed number of years to pay back their passage to the New World, a much better deal than the slaves were offered. <laughs> they didn't rob me, right? That's a lot of something. Um, no, 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 get off, not your horse. This accursed city will be the death of me. You seem troubled, friend. Mr. Franklin. That's because I am. Greatly so, in fact. What's happened? I was robbed. The old Balkan file. And though I've managed to restore what's mine, I fear it's ruined. You mean the book? This is no ordinary book. It's an almanac. The first I ever wrote. <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin, pleased to meet you. Mr. Franklin, Faith sir. Kenway. You must be new to Boston. Indeed. Why do you say that? You're still possessed of virtue. <laughs> to stop and help an old lout like myself. I... I don't mean to impose, but... You seem a spry fellow. <laughs> Should you happen to find my missing pages, I'll reward you. Look, I'm not sure if I... It's all right, all right. If you have the time, hurrah! If not, no harm done. The thing is useless in its current state anyway. But should you somehow manage to restore it, you'll find me inside that general store over there. Well, that was interesting. Collect Almanac 1733, Volume 1, Pages. The French political thinker and writer, the Baron. Benjamin Franklin. Born 1706. Benjamin Franklin was a renowned inventor, diplomat, and one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Translation, he was the rock star of the age. Benjamin Franklin was born in Boston in 1706, the tenth son of a soap maker. Ten sons, I guess his parents couldn't afford a television, and also there was no television. He began working for his brother in 1718 as an apprentice printer. However, the relationship was rocky, particularly after the elder Franklin found out that young Benjamin had been writing for the paper under a pseudonym, Silence Do Good, and writing an extremely popular column at that. Human nature being what it is, the fact that the column was popular was probably the bigger problem. Benjamin ran away in 1723 and headed for Philadelphia, where he continued his career in printing and writing, eventually buying the Pennsylvania Gazette. The business, I mean, not just a copy. That would have been one of his lesser achievements. He stayed in Philadelphia for most of his life, that is, when he wasn't making extended trips to Europe. Franklin had a talent for persuasion, and that made him an ideal diplomat. In 1757, he went to London to represent Pennsylvania in an ongoing legal battle with the Penn family. It was the first of several extended political trips to Britain, and he would act as the state representative for Massachusetts, Georgia, and New Jersey as well. In fact, Franklin was in Europe for most of the revolution, though he was in the colonies to help with the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Franklin was a vocal opponent of British impositions on the colonies, like the Stamp Act, and although he first fought for the rights of colonists as British citizens, he eventually became convinced, like many of the founding fathers, that independence was the only real solution. Unfortunately, Franklin's change of heart made him clash with his son, William, who served as the royal governor of New Jersey. William remained an active loyalist, the father and son never spoke again. When he wasn't founding the new nation and destroying his family in the process, Franklin was a scientist inventing things like bifocals and more efficient wood stoves when he wasn't mapping the Gulf Stream and discovering how electricity worked. <laughs> what have you done today? You made yourself a microwave meal and sat about in your underwear. Oh, well done you. Hey, it's a pandemic. He was also quite a lady killer, Jesus. This guy carrying on several friendships with women while he was in Europe. The records don't say what exactly they saw in him, certainly not his looks. Maybe women like a man who's intelligent. If that was true, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in Portugal surrounded by them and you'd be looking at a blank screen. Thanks. 
Who? Oh, you. Thank you. Committees of Correspondence. Since the American Revolution happened in the dark days before there was an internet, and even before telephones, organizing colonial opposition to the British was a little tricky. I don't want to make you cry, but these clowns didn't even have dial-up. The solution was to send out riders bearing letters to inform colonists in other areas what was going on. These became known as Committees of Correspondence. Correspondence being a fancy name for letters. If you did not know this, I'm amazed you have even read this far. Actually, I'm amazed you even can read this far. Samuel Adams created one of the first committees of correspondence in Boston in 1772. In particular, he wanted to keep people outside of Boston informed about town meetings so the governor couldn't invite only his friends to meetings. That would be less a meeting, more a dinner party. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Adams' committee worked so well that everyone started doing it. Eventually, all of the colonies had their own committees focused on to be one S on presenting a united front against British imposed taxes and supporting boycotts of British goods. Really, Adams should have patented the idea he could have made a fortune. Deliver the letters in Boston. Ah, you! You're a thief! God! God! Not now. Odds and ends of every description. Price to change hands. Bunch of grapes. This was one of the meeting places of the Sons of Liberty. The attraction of this particular tavern might have been the library, which included many anti-British books, or it might have been its reputation as the finest punch house in Boston, or it might even have been its location, which is right down the street from the old state house, where the legislator meet met when the Boston massacre occurred, or it might have been Darth's night. While I'd love to use the fact that the Patriots met in taverns to imply all kinds of things about them, I should point out that taverns were places to do business as well as drink, and that alcohol was viewed as more or less the cure for all ills. You're waiting for a punchline, but that's actually true. Those are the kind, the kind of doctor's, doctor's orders I gave. Okay, so first, find the general store. Walk into the void! Buy a sword and pistol. Don't I have one? To business. Yes, to business, please. Normal sword. Damn, that's expensive. This blade is useful to settle matters quickly and effectively when cl when close combat occurs. Its noiseless approach makes it reliable under any weather conditions. Slowly. Especially when the black powder is dripping wet and unusable. The guard is wide and protects the wielder's hand. Sometimes it may also be used to punch the opponent. Give me one. Just a one. Yay! Firearms? Flintlock pistol. Damn! Better accuracy at short range and is thus less powerful than a musket. However, it's more comfortable in a fight than on a battlefield and easier to wield, offering more versatility. Because of the time it takes to reload after every single shot, many people will carry two or more pistols at the same time. Try crafting a pistol sheath with two holsters to add and carry a second pistol. Guess I'm buying this one. Do I have anything to sell? No. Follow Lee to the Green Dragon on horseback. Gentlemen dilettantes, amateurs, and the curious public, Toby Locke will demonstrate tomorrow by the Belfry his latest flying contraption. We ride for the Green Dragon Tavern. The proprietors are eccentric, but the rooms are spacious and they do not pry. We've been told why it is I've come to Boston. No, Master Birch said I should know only as much as you saw fit to share. He sent me a list of names and bade me ensure you could find them. And have you had any luck with that? I, William Johnson, waits for us at the Green Dragon. How well do you know him? Not well, but he saw the order's mark and did not hesitate to come. Prove yourself loyal to our cause, and you may yet know our plans as well. I should like nothing more, sir. 
Okay. <clears throat> That's a cat. Green Dragon Tavern. This tavern is sometimes called the Headquarters of the Revolution, though I imagine when it is they pronounce it Headquarters of the Revolution, because overthrowing the government in a pub is thirsty work. It was a popular place for people like Paul Revere and Simon Adams to sit with their friends and plot. Up until 1754, the tavern was owned by William Douglas. When he died, his property was left to his daughter, Catherine Kerr, and his nephew, Cornelius Douglas. They divided the inheritance equally and it seems got along famously. The Freemasons bought the tavern in 1766 and renamed it the Freemasons Arms, which didn't actually stick because the sign above the door was still a green dragon. Freemasons are the secret society everyone knows about. Let's get a pub where we can meet in complete secret no one will ever know. Brilliant! What shall we call it? How about the Freemasons Arms? Legend has it that Paul Revere's ride was planned here, but that's unlikely. By 1774, Revere had been warned that the British were listening on his meetings and had therefore stopped making super secret plans in public where anyone could hear them. Someone tell the Masons, you know where to find them. <laughs> hey! I was uncalled for, sir. What does new email mean? I heard tale of dread pirates and fierce highwaymen. I'm guessing buildings was still a problem during the Assassin's Creed three you days. Lion, cheating, no good, son of a bitch. Perhaps we've come at a bad time. Oh, don't be foolish, dearies. Please sit. Fancy something to eat? A drink, perhaps? Or is it a bed you require? We've already let rooms here. Uh, oh yes, <laughs> of course. Masters Lee and Kenway, uh, was it? Ah, uh, I'll have your bags brought up. <clears throat> Do you require anything further? Only privacy. Sir, William Johnson. A pleasure. A good lad, if a bit earnest. I'm told you're putting together an expedition. <coughs> we believe there's a precursor site in the region. I require your knowledge of the land and its people to find it. Sadly, my research has been stolen. <laughs> Without it, I'm of no use to you. Then we'll find it. Do you have any leads? My associate, Thomas Hickey, has been making the rounds. He's quite good at loosening tongues. Well, tell me where I can find him. I'll see if I can't speed things up. We've heard rumors of bandits operating from a compound southwest of here. You'll likely find him there. Charles? Sir. We'd best be off. Of course. William Johnson, born 1715, was a land speculator and Britain's principal treaty negotiator with the indigenous peoples in the northern part of the colonies, particularly the Iroquois. Johnson was born in Ireland but moved to the colonies in 1738 to look after his uncle's property on the Mohawk River. However, it wasn't long before Johnson branched out into business for himself, acquiring property on the opposite side of the river and setting up a sawmill and trading post, which he named Mount Johnson, which to me always sounds like mating instructions from a caveman. <laughs> in 1743 he moved to an even larger parcel of land which he named Fort Johnson. He may have been an excellent businessman but it's possible he lacked an imagination. Johnson befriended the indigenous people in the area, particularly the Kanyinikeka, uh, I can't do this, whose language he learned. His respect for their customs helped him rise to prominence as liaison between the Iroquois people and the British government. I apologize to anyone who's sensitive about me butchering languages. Johnson was named Superintendent of Indian Affairs in 1756. As a contact who knows the land's people, he's probably the best you'll find. 
Now, Sean Hastings. Yeah, yeah, nice try. Sean Hastings is one of the few members of the Assassins who wasn't raised to join the Order. He was recruited as a teenager after his investigations into Abstergo Industries made him a target for the Templars. Hastings has a gift for organization, and as such, the Assassins would be lost without him. With his talent for making connections between historical events, he's widely regarded as the most intelligent person in the Order. And by widely regarded as the most intelligent person in the Order, I mean he is the most intelligent person in the Order. You may think he's an arrogant bastard, but that's only because he's smarter than you, and like a less than able teenage girl, you find yourself not yet secure enough to move past your inherent and powerful feelings of joyless jealousy and simply appreciate me for who I am. Oh good, you're actually reading this. I was beginning to wonder if I was wasting my time, because you know how much I love wasting my time. Now, make me some tea, would you? Right. Follow Mr. Charles Lee. I'll look into Thomas Hickey later. I definitely would not be giving him a hickey. That's it, cut to different place. That's a dog. Can I pet the dog? Please let me pet the dog. Yes, you can pet the dog! Oh my god, this game is awesome. Pet him again. Good dog. Okay, 14 out of 10, perfect game. <laughs> You're a cute mutt. Thomas Hickey? Who's asking? Haytham Kenway. Is that supposed to mean something? Show some respect, boy. Peace, Charles. William Johnson sent us in the hopes we might expedite your search. But don't need no expediting. Don't need none of your fancy London speak, neither. I found the men that done the theft. Then why are you just lazing around? Figuring out how to deal with those varlets. I have an idea. Well, let's hear it. I'll kill the lookout. Take up a position behind the guards. Uh, you two, approach from the front. When I open fire on the group, you charge in. We'll have the element of surprise on our side. Half will fall before they've even realized what's happened. Okay. Press W to shoot. Get into position. But wait for me to take the first shot. Kill mercenaries using firearms. Loot! Loot! Go I don't care about the body. Put the guard at the fort's entrance. You two, clear off! Uh, fire? Reload. Reload. Pick up the weapon. Reload. Hang on a minute. Attack, left button, tools, tools, weapon selector. So, how is it to reload? Tools, right holster, smoke bombs, oh, money. Pick up another one. Got a 
match for the element of surprise. this thing, pick up another thing and run for help how do you reload? fall back! fall back! we'll be safe inside! what now? We can blow the door with those. Go on, shoot them. <laughs> on with the show then. Um, does anyone have a rifle I can take? That reload doesn't make sense. Give me a second. Controls. Customize controls. But... How? What? This is a weapon. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, now it makes more sense. Let's do this thing. Guess they wasn't so safe inside after all. Lay down your weapons, and I'll consider letting you live. I make you the same offer. We've no quarrel. I only wish to return this chest to its rightful owner. Nothing rightful about Mr. Johnson. Oh, really? I won't ask again. Agreed. Well, sucks to be you then. Your kind has no need for books and maps. Who put you up to this? Never seen a person. It's always been dead drops and letters. But they always pay, so we do the jobs. Well, those days are done. Tell your masters I said as much. <laughs> Who should I say you are? You don't. They'll know. Hmm. Hey, Fum. This one's got some shot on him. You might want to be grabbing it on account of your pistol being parched. My pistol's fine, but sure. A shame, sir. Back to the Green Dragon, then. I need a drink. Wait, wait, I'm not done looting. Also, pick up this thing. Company. Don't let go of the chest, Charles. We'll take care of this rabble. Wait, them bodies is sure to have loot on them. Would be a shame to let it all go to waste. Sure. Are you mad? In case you've forgotten, we're in the midst of something. Aw, why you always got to go and spoil the sport? Spoil the sport. Oh, that man! 
Well, whatever's in this chest is worth it. Come on now, it's just a few fools with knives. They ain't so tough. It's not the scoundrels I'm concerned with. I need one more to kill with a weapon. With the firearms. Good. the remaining guards on the roof. You guys good? Give me a minute. Last of them. Oi! Mr. Johnson's gonna need to double my pay after all this if he expects me to keep at his side. You can talk to him about that. <sighs> there you are. My thanks, Master Kinway. No. Tell me what it is you need. The images on this amulet, are they familiar to you? Perhaps one of the tribes has shown you something similar. It appears Kanyan Gahaga in origin. Kanyan Gahaga. Can you trace it to a specific location? I need to know where it came from. With my research returned, perhaps. Let me see what I can do. Thomas! What? Rent yourself a room. And a bath as well. I suspect we'll be here for a while. Thank you. Next on the list. Let's not start that yet. He's playing a game. Intermediate. Okay, let's try that again. One game, then I'm done. Bet amount, 10. Place the bet. It's a simpler board. 
Yeah. Obviously. Damn, he locked me in. Okay. What are you playing? Intermediate. Yes. Bet 10. Till I figure this game out. Should have seen another one coming. Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, damn it. Good. Now what? What the hell was that? Go again. No. Place the bet. Oh, damn it. Hmm. 
you stupid ass. Oh my god, I'm so bad at this. Oh my god, he's murdering me. Won't take long to win at this rate. Yeah, no shit. He's killing me. Hmm. That's it, I'm dead. Got you now. Nope, I'm gone. Fine, fine. I lost. You win. I suck. I want another go at this guy. Yes. No. Yes, yes. Move here. This guy over here. Move. Move. What else? Move. Come on. What is the matter with you? Why don't you move? What is going on? Move! Seriously? What the hell? Move. Well, 
Screw that. I'm done. Go away. Get out of here.